you don't want to mess with gamma rays. I mean it, I mean it. You know, you meet a gamma ray on the street, you just keep on walking. You don't want to get involved in that kind of scene. Gamma rays are the highest energy form of electromagnetic radiation. This is the hard stuff, okay? Gamma rays have wavelengths a million to a billion to a trillion times shorter than visible light that gives them energies millions and billions and trillions of times more energetic than visible light. Okay, gamma rays have wavelengths so small that they, they don't even really act like radiation anymore. In most cases, they just act, they, they essentially act like high energy particles. They, they, they act like tiny, tiny little electromagnetic bullets. It's like almost impossible to stop a gamma ray because they're so small. If you set up like a screen and you're like, I'm gonna bounce some gamma rays off of this, this screen, the gamma rays just like slip in between everything because they're so small and they just come out the other side. All right, and, and you can't, it's like almost impossible to reflect them or refract them. Like it took a long time. Gamma rays were first discovered way back in the early 20th century as a form of radiation. People were first discovering radiation, people were first investigating radiation, and they found that when you have a big pile of radioactive goo, that there are three kinds of radiation that come out of it. They, and they call them alpha, beta, and gamma rays. And these were ordered in terms of increasing penetrative power. So the alpha rays would get blocked really easily, then the beta rays would go a little bit before getting blocked, and then the gamma rays would just shoot on through and end up giving you cancer, and they were horrible. It took a long time to realize that the alpha rays were really uh, nuclei, the beta rays were really electrons, and then the gamma rays were a form of radiation. And so think about that. Gamma rays are associated with nuclear processes. Gamma rays carry a lot of energy. Gamma rays are not your friend. What they can do to your insides is they can just decide, they can look at one of your nice little molecules and they can just like flick an electron off. It's bing! Or they can split up some molecules if they feel like it. And then you've got these, you know, these radicals running around without electrons or split in half and then that's how you get damage, cellular damage, DNA damage, cancer. It's, it's nasty stuff, okay? So just stay away from the gamma rays. And you certainly, certainly want to stay away from the gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts, I love, I love the history of gamma ray bursts and how they were discovered. So back in the 60s, uh, you know, the U.S., and the Soviets were testing nuclear weapons like crazy because that's what they did. And then they decided, hey, maybe we should stop testing nuclear weapons. So they signed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. I'm, I'm summarizing history here, but I'm not a historian. They signed the Test Ban Treaty. All right, fine, no more, no more nuclear weapons tests. But the US wasn't exactly sure if the Soviets would you know, keep up their end of the bargain. So they launched some satellites called the Vela program. And the Vela satellites were gamma ray detectors because it turns out when you blow up a nuclear bomb, there's a lot of nuclear processes happening. There's a big flash of gamma rays that come out of it. And if you have an orbiting satellite, you can see the flash of gamma rays and you say, aha, I caught you red handed because you're communist. Anyway, moving on. You can spot it. The Vela satellite saw flashes of gamma rays but coming from the wrong direction. They weren't coming from Earth, they were coming from space. And over the course of a few years, they saw more and more and more. And eventually in 1973, the whole thing was declassified. And they're like, hey, astronomers, so funny story. There's a bunch of flashes of gamma rays coming from deep space have fun with that. And the astronomers became very interested in it, built their own gamma ray observatories, and we're seeing what they called gamma ray bursts. And it's important to remember that a gamma ray burst isn't necessarily a 
thing. It's not a single process in the universe, but rather a category of observations. It is simply a flash of gamma rays coming from space, a gamma ray burst, that's all it is. And for decades, we didn't know what was causing gamma ray bursts because like most high energy things in the universe, gamma ray bursts are pretty rare. So it's hard to build statistics. It's hard to get a sense of what's going on when they're pretty rare. And in like most high energy things, no two are alike. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter. Sometimes they're associated with older galaxies. Sometimes they're associated with younger galaxies. Sometimes they peak really, really super bright and sometimes they don't. Sometimes there are two peaks and then it goes away. And, and so it's like, how can you make heads and tails of this? It took decades before we were finally able to get a good grip on exactly what a gamma ray burst is. There are two broad categories of gamma ray bursts, basically the only categorization that astronomers were able to make. And you know how much astronomers love to categorize things. So when there's only two categories, you know there's a lot of mysteries here and, and astronomers are having a really hard time. But there's two kinds, there's the short and there's the long. Short gamma ray bursts last less, less than two seconds. Long gamma ray bursts last longer than two seconds. That, that. That's all we got. But anyway, let me start with the long gamma ray bursts. The long gamma ray bursts, besides being long, were generally found to be associated with, with uh, star forming galaxies, either galaxies that had a lot of star formation in them or the star forming regions of other galaxies. So we would see gamma ray bursts coming from say spiral arms of galaxies, places where there's a lot of stellar activity. And all these gamma ray bursts were coming from uh, incredibly far away. I think the closest one is like 140 million light years away. And so that's a lot of energy. And if, if you try to calculate like what can produce that much energy, like, like the brightness of one of these long gamma ray bursts is about the brightness of a typical star on our night sky but it's coming from 140 million light years away. So yeah, that's a lot of energy. So you, uh, the challenge here was to like, what can power something like that? What can efficiently drive so much gamma rays? And the big clues came really not until the 1990s and early 2000s, where we started to see gamma ray bursts associated with supernova, where we'd see a gamma ray burst and then we'd see a supernova. and, and only long gamma ray bursts were associated with supernova. And we came up with a physical model to explain what is happening with a gamma ray burst. We call this, and it's one of the most wonderful names in all of science, the collapsar. So to, to what we think, in order to make a long gamma ray burst, you need a few ingredients. You need a star, but it can't be any star, it has to be big. It has to be at least 40 times the mass of the sun. It has to be rapidly rotating. It has to lose a lot of its outer atmosphere, okay? So it has to be thinned out, and then it needs to collapse. It needs to form an iron core, it needs to bounce off that iron core, it needs to do the usual supernova thing. But in the middle of doing the usual supernova thing, the core forms a black hole. That's why you need the star to be big enough so that you can collapse that thing down to actually make a black hole. So now you've got temporarily a situation where you've got a black hole surrounded by layers and layers of, of giant star. The rest of that star is still collapsing, falling into that black hole. If it's rotating fast enough, it will form an accretion disk around that black hole. And then accretion disk can drive incredibly strong electric and magnetic fields that can whip that material around the black hole and then shoot it out in the form of two jets. These jets then run into all the remaining material of the star, and if it's thinned out enough, it can actually punch through. And these jets of high energy particles in the process of slamming through will generate a lot of gamma rays and you'll get a burst of gamma rays, a gamma ray burst. So the explanation for long gamma ray bursts is that there are these giant stars all over the universe that are dying, turning into black holes, briefly powering these massive jets, and if the jet just so happens to line up at pointed at the Earth, 
we get the flash of gamma rays. But that's the long gamma ray burst, which is around 70% of all gamma ray bursts. There's also the short ones. And the short ones were much more of a mystery because these were associated not with star forming regions of galaxies, but with older galaxies, elliptical galaxies, dead galaxies, red galaxies. And here is another question, like how do you power something like a gamma ray burst from a population of dead and decaying stars? Like just where do you get the energy? To give you a sense, a typical gamma ray burst will have enough energy. Imagine converting Jupiter, Jupiter, its entire rest mass energy into gamma rays. That's the amount of energy going into a gamma ray burst. These are among the most powerful and sometimes the most powerful events in the entire universe. That's a lot of energy. How do you convert Jupiter into a gamma ray bomb? What does it take? What we saw with a long gamma ray burst, it takes a black hole forming in the center of a dying star. That'll do the trick. But with these short ones, it can't be that big of a system. It has to be very, very small. It has to be very compact because the whole thing is happening very quickly in less than two seconds. So this whole system has to be very compact. It wasn't until 2017 that we were able to nail it. In 2017, we saw a gamma ray burst. The Fermi Space Telescope saw a gamma ray burst. Say, okay, here's another gamma ray burst. Let, it, uh, let the, all the other astronomers know, like, hey, you might want to follow up. We saw something cool. Around the same time, Gravitational wave observatories in the US and Italy found the distinct gravitational wave signature of two neutron stars colliding. And these signals arrived within three seconds of each other and they arrived from the same point on the sky. And we did a bunch of follow up observations and we found our first confirmed kilonova. Kilonova is the name we give to neutron stars colliding. Turns out when neutron stars colliding, it's a hot mess. Then neutron stars merge together and then they rip each other apart through the extreme tidal forces, the extreme gravitational forces. Sometimes they form a black hole, sometimes they just form a neutron star. But either way, in the meantime, you get a whole hot mess and you get an accretion disk and you get a jet and you get a burst of gamma rays. Because the system is very small, neutron stars are no bigger than cities. Because the neutron stars are very, very small, you get a very short, brief burst of gamma rays. You don't have a lot of time to generate the big stuff and go on for a long time. And this explains why the short gamma ray bursts are associated with red galaxies, dead galaxies, because these are the galaxies with lots of neutron stars to spare. Because neutron stars are the leftovers of giant stars. You expect a lot of neutron stars in a dead galaxy. You expect them to merge together every once in a while. You expect the short gamma ray bursts. But that's not all. Collapsars and kilonovas explain the vast majority of, of gamma ray bursts, both short and long, but there are other possibilities. One possibility is something we call a tidal disruption event or TDE. This is when a giant black hole swallows a whole star. First, it rips it to shreds. In the process of ripping it to shreds, accretion disk, jet, burst of gamma rays, gamma ray burst. Another possibility is in the case of magnetars. Magnetars are the super fast spinning, super magnetized version of a neutron star. Magnetars are the most magnetized objects in the universe. So right there, you've got a lot going on in terms of magnetic fields and electric fields and electromagnetic radiation. And you've got that a lot of power, a lot of energy. What can happen is uh, neutron stars can occasionally glitch or crack and they just like rearrange themselves. They can build up tension, 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 and then reset themselves and release a flash of radiation in the form of gamma rays. So we think between all four of these, between the collapsars, the kilonovas, the tidal disruption events, and the magnetars, we think we can explain the vast majority of gamma ray bursts, but again, gamma ray bursts aren't a thing. They're not a single astrophysical event. They are a kind of observation. They are a category of observation. I'm not saying it's that stars blowing up is responsible for some gamma ray bursts, 
but I'm also not ruling it out. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider contributing to keep this show going. It's patreon.com slash pmsutter. There's a link right there in the description, and I'll see you next week.